Starting us off this morning is Marie Fromm. She's going to be talking to us about cloud encryption, how to not suck at securing your encryption keys. Take it away, Marie. Thank you. Yes, that's going to be the goal of today's talk, how to suck less. Uh, so anyway, a little bit about who I am. I, uh, I work in InfoSec uh, cryptography, and I'm trans. I've done a lot of stuff over the years, incident response, security testing, reversing, security architecture. And for the rest of my r uh, career, I really want to fix things. I, I, I see, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, throw bricks through windows and stuff. And, you know, I want to work with builders to actually fix stuff. And, you know, it's, I think it's really important because right now there's a lot of really negative things happening. Uh, because we are failing at security so badly. So I want to see things suck less. Now, what kind of got me thinking about this talk was something that affected probably most of the people in this room was the Equifax data breach. And they had the CEO up on the stand, and they were asking, you know, one of the questions was obvious, was, well, was your data encrypted? And he actually said he didn't know, which was amazing. Um, so I, I just, I, I was just stupefied by that, first off. And then the thing that really, really, really upset me was after they saw, they kind of issued some clarifications. They said, well, you know, maybe some of it was encrypted, maybe some of it wasn't, but you know, encryption doesn't really help. And, and I just, and then you saw the pundits, you know, on all the columns and stuff about, well, yeah, you know, encryption doesn't really help prevent. And, it's, and I just, I know that for the people in this room, I would almost guarantee that most of you would be able to encrypt something that I couldn't read. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, you know, kind of a basic thing. And to make statements that, well, encryption doesn't really help prevent data breaches is a really bad message. And it's, uh, it's partly due to the way things are being done the way cryptography has been used, uh, both on ground and prem and data centers and in the cloud. So I'm going to talk through a few different areas. I'm actually going to start uh, start on ground and talk about um, data center encryption. It's, it's oftentimes kind of typical. Uh, here's a big, big storage frame, you know, you'd find in a big IT shop. And uh, you know the product slick, it's got all these cool things, you know, strong data at rest protection, you know, it talks about. And uh, they, they go on and they say, you know, this, these, these are protected by, uh, you know, AES, which, is, which will protect top secret government data. You know, so I mean, they make these claims and, you know, the EMC dude, you know, uh, makes a huge sale. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the execs feel good. You know, our data is encrypted at rest. And, um, but let's talk a little bit about how these work before we get into the cloud. So system operation, you know, it boots up, big Herkin machine. Um, you know, and actually I, I should uh, make a, I, I started out this slide writing, um, you know, data written to Rust, and I thought, oh wow, you know, that, so, so for you younger ones, you know, in the old days, we had these uh, spinning rusty things that we wrote data to, and now it's all flash, but uh, yeah, you'll have to Google that shit. It's really <laughs> great, great. Uh, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, but the main, so this, these systems boot up, they read an encryption key that's, some, you know, it's, they try to protect it, and then all data written as transparently encrypted as it writes, writes to the storage media. And then on reads, it's transparently decrypted. And so there actually is no awareness to the server of the application that this encryption is happening. Completely transparent, you know, systems connected via, uh, you know, NAS or SAN, they just, they think they're reading and writing data, and it's cool. And it's, we're encrypted at rest, right? You know, that sounds really good. Um, so, so one of the things about this, if we look at this and say, how well does this kind of encryption protect our data? Let's say, say we had something like this, and, you know, it does meet compliance requirements. We check that box that, you know, hey, it's AES encrypted at rest. But what happens if we have a data breach? So... Attacker comes in, we'd actually do a flowchart, a real simple flowchart. Attacker tries to access the data. Was the storage frame on? Ah, oh, bummer. The encryption did not protect our data. Was the storage frame off? Hey, we win. We protected our data. So you have to, you know, that's, that's one of the things that when people say encrypted at rest, you really have to understand what kind of threats that protects against. 
So, you know, we look back at the storage frame example on the ground, you know, it, it protects against a pretty narrow model of threats. Like say, you know, I have some bad drives and the EMC dude comes in and to replace them and he's taken them back to the depot. Um, and a couple fall off of his bicycle. You know, that's, um, you know, I can say, you know, those drives were encrypted at rest. They were powered down, they weren't spinning. <clears throat> so, so this form of encryption, if you think about this, this thing that people say, oh yeah, it's encrypted at rest, you know, it, it just protects against this very narrow threat. So when somebody says this, hey, my data is encrypted at rest, whether we're talking cloud or ground, you really need to dig a lot, lot deeper. So <clears throat> let's dive into the cloud. Now, first of all, I'll say, you know, not all data should be in the cloud. You really need to think about risk modeling, about, uh, you know, understanding what your threats are, your compensating controls. And I'm not, I'm not here to bash cloud. Um, you know, I think, you know, AWS, Azure, people are using it successfully in a lot of cases. <clears throat> but a lot of people are not thinking about cloud implementations of cryptography that actually protects data. And, uh, you know, so, so AWS, they give you all this amazing functionality, do all sorts of stuff. It's, it's almost, it's staggeringly complex. There's so many different things you can do with AWS. It's like every week I get an email, the new things are adding to it, and it's like, wow, wow, wow. And it's like, I don't know how you can stay up on a lot. But, um, and actually I'll say AWS does give you some primitives that can apply a certain level of encryption to do things reasonably well for certain use cases. Uh, but you really have to do proper systems engineering in this, because if you don't, uh, this stuff is not going to be encrypted against the threats you care about, like, you know, the, somebody actually trying to take over your system and steal your data. Now, you know, there, there is some interesting differences, like in AWS, uh, I don't know if you looked at it, but they've got uh, different, they operate in different geographies. And, um, and I'll just say uh, some of them are kind of interesting, like, uh, uh, China has stripped out all the encryption, even the, the encryption built into the platform. Uh, it's got no IAM or two-factor authentication, and so that might have some security implications in what you're building. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so as we get into, uh, let's take a really simple example. So a simple building block is S3 encryption. And it's used for, you use it for all sorts of stuff. It's a, it's a basic, fundamental piece of technology for storing a chunk of data. Now, a lot of people don't necessarily real, realize this, but there's actually quite a few different ways you can en encrypt S3 data. So there's uh, server-side encryption options include server-side with the key managed by S3, server-side with the key managed by KMS, or Amazon's key management service. And you can also do server-side encryption with customer-managed keys that you manage, say, in a variety of ways. Uh, it could be outside of KMS. And then there's actually client-side encryption options, which can make a lot of sense to encrypt data before I ever stuff it up in there. But, but just this, this very basic primitive of quote, encrypting data in S3 has got a whole bunch of different ways to do it. So like say I'm a dev and I'm trying to figure this stuff out and I'll look at S3 and here's this default encryption. It's a <laughs> checkbox. That looks really good to me. I love doing stuff with checkboxes because it's, I can go on and I can think about the application development. I can think about, you know, all this stuff, the wonderful things, the business benefits my app's going to do and I, I, I can check that box and the security folks are going to be happy. And, um, you know, there are some, some kind of interesting things about the way Amazon does this with uh, the S3 encryption. Uh, they actually unique, they encrypt each, each bucket with a unique key, which is good. You don't have a, this shared key that unlocks a whole bunch of stuff. <clears throat> they, they encrypt the key itself with a master key that it rotates regularly. Hey, that's kind of cool, you know, key rotation, critical part of controlling your encryption keys. Um, <clears throat> Again, it uses one of the strongest block ciphers available. This is right from the marketing material, AES-256, to encrypt your data. <clears throat> so, so this is, this looks really easy to me. I can check a box and, and I'm done. <clears throat> but it's, it's not really that simple. And so 
for an analogy, I would like to talk about a physical system. <clears throat> so <clears throat> go, taking this, this context of an S3 bucket where it's doing this automated encryption, if I apply it to a door, a door that I want to secure in a room that's got some stuff in it that I want to protect, I can go out and I can buy a really nice deadbolt. These are, these are really good deadbolts. There's, there's probably somebody in Lockpick Village that knows a way of opening these, but, uh, uh, but for, for most of us, I know I can't pick that deadbolt. I probably can't saw it. It's designed to not be beatable open. <clears throat> and imagine this, this deadbolt in front of this door and it's protecting people from going in, grabbing the stuff I'm trying to protect and walking out. So this is, this is kind of similar to our S3 bucket. We, we want to make sure the right people are going in and getting our stuff. But I would kind of assert that that last example of saying apply the default encryption to S3 is a little bit like having this massive door, this really nice deadbolt, but leaving the key in the door. Now that doesn't really protect that data, right? Because anybody that can walk up to that door, they, they see and they can, they can turn the lock. So I mean, they may have to do some positioning to get in front of the door, you know, maybe you know, to take it back to the controls you might have in a web application. Maybe they tunnel up through the floor, or cut through the ceiling, or punch in a wall. But if they can get in front of that door, if that key's there, they just turn it and walk through. Grab your stuff and walk out. So this is kind of a design pattern that is not so great. Well, we can actually point to it. We can say it's encrypted. We can sign a paper that's encrypted at rest for this code encryption. But uh, it's actually not really very effective in stopping people from walking out with our stuff. So there's a principle, the uh, Kirchhoff's principle. It's kind of famous, and it says any crypto system uh, should be secure if everything is known about the system except for... Uh, except for the key, that that can all be public knowledge. Well, if we're not managing our keys correctly or properly or securely, or we're leaving them in the door lock, <clears throat> we certainly aren't really controlling this system from a cryptography perspective. We're, we're failing. So just maybe I'm saying that if we check that little checkbox and say using S3 server-side encryption with keys that are managed by S3, which sounds so easy because it's uh, just a checkbox, Maybe that isn't the protection that we wanted or needed. So let's go on to the next way of encrypting data in S3. And I'm, remember, I'm just talking about one service and all these different ways of encryption. <clears throat> I can use server-side encryption, but instead of having S3 manage the keys, I can put those in AWS KMS, which is their Amazon's key management service. Now that comes with some kind of interesting things that I'm going to dive into. There's a lot of different ways you can set up Amazon KMS, and I'm going to get into those. <clears throat> so here's, I just change a checkbox, <clears throat> and I select the key that I provisioned in KMS, and I'm off to the races. Sounds pretty good, right? Now, now you know, maybe I'm, I'm a dev and say, okay, well, now I just got to generate a key thingy, and, um, and now, now I just encrypt, and now I'm good. <clears throat> now, KMS can be used for a lot of, a lot of things. Um, they've designed it to integrate with all their services. You know, you've got S3 Bucket, CBS, Glacier, do long-term storage. You've got RDS for relational database services. Um, so, so it is pretty cool. I can build this, you know, simplified infrastructure. Somebody is trying to develop cloud apps, and I'm just trying to get my, my thing out the door. <clears throat> I can use this KMS thingy to hold the keys, and that, that sounds kind of good because, well, because it's a says it manages keys, and it's like, well, it's got to be better, right? Well, let's dive just a little bit into KMS and see if some of the problems that we had <clears throat> with the, the key and the lock with the deadbolt, if we can see how we can stay away from those. Well, Amazon's key management service is pretty interesting. Um, and actually, as in everything Amazon, there's like five ways to do things. <clears throat> I can, in key management services, I can use AWS managed customer master keys, CMKs, and, and these are keys that are created, managed, and used on my application's behalf by the AWS service that is integrated with AWS KMS. <clears throat> I can also use customer managed keys. So rather than just letting Amazon just kind of do it automatically, I can actually 
generate, use a customer managed key. And, and I can do some extra things with that. It's kind of cool. I have some extra controls that I would argue may be wise on applications with very critical data. So these things, these include things like um, enabling and disabling the CMK, which actually is, is an important thing to come to later, is if something bad's happening and you can detect it later on in the stack, I can disable that CMK and actually prevent it from being used. So I can rotate its cryptographic material. I, and I can also set up IAM policies or identity and access management policies uh, that cover access to that specific CMK. Uh, I can use that CMK in cryptographic operations and I, I can do encryption as part of my code, which is kind of cool. And, um, I, but, but the important thing is I, as a customer, re maintain control of that CMK. Uh, now there's data keys, and those live outside KMS. Uh, it, KMS doesn't manage or control those. And um, there's customer master keys, key encryption keys, and data encryption keys. And so we've gotten a little bit more complex. And that dev that just wanted to click a box and say, yeah, I want this thing encrypted, now there's, there's a whole lot of things to talk about or you know, think about or design into. You know, multiple ways of encrypting with S3. And then if I use KMS, multiple ways of managing KMS. So, so some things you know you might be thinking about is like, well, you know, what what does this give me using you know doing customer managed keys? Well, I, I named a few of the benefits. Like I can do I can do my own rotation. I can actually disable. And there's some, there's some kind of cool things that I can I can do. It gives me a little more fine tuned control. And I'm going to go into the permissions in a bit, which is even you know maybe better. <clears throat> but some of the things when I'm generating keys, one of the things that's really critical to me is using really good ran using a known good source of random. Um, you know, I think, I, I believe uh, KMS has got uh, FIPS 140-2 rating and some other, you know, they've, they're, they've, they're working on certifications, but, you know, picking random for a key generation is a really big deal. And in, crypt in cryptography, we've seen this fail over and over and over and over again. You know, it's like a long list of failures of uh, poor random being used to generate a key and the system gets owned. So this this thing about um, this thing about generating the key, you want to really be careful or understand where your random comes from, and that that may give you a reason why you should be generating your own keys. There's also kind of another thing that another reason maybe to do this and, and customer generated keys is if um, think about the clouds. You know, sometimes they turn dark and stormy and violent, <clears throat> and if you don't have your cryptographic key material for your applications stored somewhere safe on ground, um, you could set yourself up for a pretty significant uh, availability issue because now you've got encrypted data and no keys to, to access the application. But um, always, you know, the, the selection of random in cryptographic key generation, as I'm sure everybody knows here, is a really, really big deal. So. I'm going to talk, I'm going to go slide back into the KMS and uh, on that second option, customer master, uh, CMKs that are customer ma managed. Wow, that's a hard one to say. <laughs> customer master keys that are customer master managed. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> there's, you know, as, again, isn't everything in AWS? There's a variety of ways. So, so we're talking, you know, the multiple ways of encrypting S3 and multiple ways of using KMS. And now we're going to talk about multiple ways of applying controls to these keys, which is kind of interesting. Um, there's, there's three things that I can use to apply what, what controls access to these, these encryption keys. Uh, there's a key policy document that's, um, that describes uh, usage uh, of the key I'll show you in a second. There's IAM policies, or identity and access management policies. <clears throat> and, and these, uh, you can use those in combination with a CMK uh, key policy to allow access to a CMK. Um, there, there, this actually gets kind of complicated to simulate. Uh, there, there's an IAM policy simulator tool that Amazon has provided to kind of help figure this out. Because it, you know, it's, I, I've been in the position of trying to review like what, what has access to this key? And it, it, it is non-trivial to dig into sometimes. 
Um, and then the third way of applying controls to this key is grants. <clears throat> and, and these are kind of cool because you can then um, specify with a high degree of granularity exactly what service and what, what thing can use, use a key for and how. And that's, that's really important. Um, there's, and I'll, I'll show a couple um, examples of you know, the key operators and, and how they can be different with grants, which is kind of neat. And they're an, they're an alternative to the key policy. So you know, we started the S3, multiple ways of encrypting, KMS, multiple ways of doing KMS, and now we've picked this one option, customer master keys, we've got multiple ways of doing this. There's a lot of permutations here, and a lot of landfall, or minefields for devs. Um, here's a simple key access policy, and uh, don't believe me, this is uh, not real, so yeah, you, you won't own my system. Um, so nothing, nothing about this, this is all fictional, so. Um, but this, is, this would be typical for a key administrator or a custodian. So this, in, in key management, one of, the, one of your principles is you want to have a separation of duties. You want to have people, maybe you know, DevOps people and developers that are putting up applications together, and they, can, they have a permission to have an application, you know, tie, tie a given key to an application, and that application has permission to use a key to do something. But then you typically have another team, if you're doing it right, with a separation of duties that has management capability on those keys. And so this has got some, um, some things like disable, delete, schedule key deletion, cancel key deletion, revoke. So these are some more administrative level things when you have that separation of duties for key management. So this is, um, oh yeah, it's also possible to constrain a CMK so it can only be used by a specific AWS service through the use of a KMS via service conditional statement. So I can actually really nail this key down and say, you know, this can be used for this one thing, period, which is pretty cool. I can kind of limit the usage of that key. Now here's kind of a couple slides showing some differences of key access grants. Now I may want to bisect my application <laughs> and say, I have some internet forward facing logic where people enter something into a form. And, and you know, and that's what they do. Random people connect to the internet, you know, enter some stuff in a form, and it goes in. Maybe there's an auth function, some other stuff. And then I got a separate team of people that work for the company <clears throat> that connect to the same system, and they need to do some management functions. They need to do some lookups, maybe some edits, you know, check some stuff. Um, so if you bisect your application to where you have the internet facing logic, and you have configured it uh, for instance, to where that internet facing logic can only have access to the encrypt function of that key. That's all it can do. It can encrypt, period. It can decrypt. So even if that application gets owned, it doesn't have the rights via this grant to decrypt any data. So, so the, the attacker that got, got, that, got root on that box, um, they do not have the ability to decrypt data with this grant. Now maybe you have a separate network, maybe through a you know, direct connect or a VPN, where your people doing the management on the system, the maintenance of it, or you know the call it the the, the application owners, um, they maybe you know they may need they quite likely need the decrypt function. So so this is an example of using these different grants to give different parts of the application different permissions and to help build a little bit more defensive depth into your app and say you know the internet facing stuff we we don't want them to ever be able to decrypt any data. So I've been talking, you know, I was working my way through S3 buckets and encryption. Now there's the last one, server-side encryption customer with keys that you manage, maybe outside KMS or with a different system. And then there's also client-side encryption op options. And I really do like those because you, you get a fine-grained control over your data of, of what you're encrypting. And if you think about it, if I control the encryption, I get data encrypted before it's ever stuck in S3, I don't have to worry about you know, what happens you know, when somebody screws up permissions on that bucket or changes an, you know, an ACL or something like that. You know, I think that's consistent you know, with ISO 27040, you know, using encryption to, to actually create these partitions of you know, who can access things. And I, I think that that client-side encryption, um, if you encrypt it before you put an S3, you won't be in the headlines about, and you manage it, you keep those keys secured, um, and that whole process that encrypts the data and acts on it, 
uh, you will not be in the papers, which is really good. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's, there's also not just the door. And I, I think one of the things, you know, to extend this a little bit, kind of the story I'm building, if, you know, that first story I talked about that door, and I've got that awesome deadbolt on, I can point to it, say that's my FIPS 140-2 rated deadbolt, and, uh, you know, it, I can't beat this thing open, I can't pick this lock, um, but I'm going to leave the key in the door, and people walk in and out with my stuff, well, I'm screwed. Now, in a, you know, I don't know how many of you have been to a commercial data center, but um, the process to get in is typically a little more involved. Um, you, you walk up to a bulletproof window and you provide your identification. Uh, they perform visual identification against your ID. They then look and look in the computer and see if you're authorized to be there and say, yeah, you have a ticket to go in and do X and Y and Z at this time. Uh, this all looks right. And then rather than you going and turn a key in the lock, um, they buzz a door into a man trap and you go in that. Then you stand there and to get out of the man trap and to proceed, you need, a, you need a, a, some, some additional credentials with some badging and some two-factor token and stuff. And then that gets you out and then you're in. Now there's, there's also, there's a human involved in these logging stuff that you went in there. You had, a, you had a ticket to go in and do X, Y, and Z. And hopefully they're, you know, and, and they're typically awake enough to say, yeah, you come in here every three months and you do a thing and you leave. Now, if, um, if I come in and I've, I've made four trips in and out in a day, that's unusual. And if I try to haul boxes out, that's like double unusual because we're not supposed to be hauling boxes out. So it's like, they, that's a detective control built around that, you know, the uh, authentication, the authorization check and all that. And so we've built a little bit more controls over whether I can walk out of the stuff. Now, with AWS, those are some of the things we need to be thinking of as we're building applications. It's not like, is, do, are we using uh, strong encryption? It's not doing bupkis to actually protect the data. We need to build these controls, um, these additional things, these additional layers around the application um, to, do, to do this properly. So um, there are other ways of managing encryption keys in AWS. Of course, there are. There's many, many different ways to do these things. Um, so, whoops, I just lost. Oh, it scared me. I thought, oh no, I went dark. I'm panicking. It's like my laptop's plugged in. It's like I was freaking out for a second. I thought, oh shit. <laughs> so, um, so, Amazon actually has had a, a variety of things for doing key storage that aren't KMS. Uh, they had Cloud HSM V1 or the classic HM, and that's, that's just a, um, uh, just a simple Gemalto uh, hardware security module. A hardware security module, if you don't know, is this specialized box that's designed to have secure random, generate encryption keys and protect them in hardware and tamper-proof kind of systems to, to ensure that these keys can't be compromised. So HSMs are used for, you know, for serious key management, for keys that have some pretty big implication if they were ever to be compromised. Um, so if you're not familiar with an HSM, they had Amazon, um, they still support it in a couple of the regions, Cloud HSM v1, which is the uh, Jamalto Luna. And they, they also, they produced an HSM v2, which is kind of interesting. They've kind of produced their own. And uh, they've submitted it for uh, a FIPS review. And then, you know, there's, there's third party key management solutions. I, I listed one, there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. There's different HSM vendors, there's different key management solutions. Um, and this is, you know, if, if I had like a day to do this, I could talk about a whole bunch of different ones, but I got an hour, so I'm gonna kind of focus on one. But uh, that's another thing that, that can keep keys securely. So um, this is kind of interesting. You know, this is, Amazon is submitted for uh, FIPS validation, uh, their cryptographic module validation. Um, and it's, uh, they, they got the stuff on it. It's, uh, it's got some interesting design aspects to it. I really encourage you, if you're, if you're storing encryption keys and you're doing it in hardware, you should actually read these, uh, these module verification documents. They're fantastic, they're a wealth of knowledge in, in how these things are protecting encryption keys. And what kind of, what kind of threats, and what, what was their threat model? What's the security boundary? And what are, how are these tested, and what do they protect against? And, and if you dive into these NIST documents, it's a really cool way of, of understanding a lot better. And, and you can also ask some interesting questions um, when you're talking to the, 
AWS people, for instance. So um, as I talked about that option, you know, there's also HSMs that we use for key management from Tumulto, from Talos. Tumulto is a big player in, in this stuff. If you've got a cell phone or a US passport with a chip or a credit card, you have technology that was made by them. I'm not a shill for the company, but they do make a lot of they do make a lot of stuff. Um, so there's this is an example of a pin entry device that, um, that's used with um, Jamalto equipment. And, and there's an important principle is, you know, if you're two factor, you know, it's we all use, gotta use 2FA now. Um, that's kind of common sense. But there's, so there's some additional things in here and that we can use um, K of N or M of N operations. So we, we say, you know, we've got these five people on this team and we want to have at least three of them come together to do this operation. You can specify that and say, you know, we want to do this operation of transferring these keys as one to this other thing and we, we want to make sure it's done in a very controlled manner. We want to make sure there can't be collusion or an individual just can't go off the rails and say, I'm going to steal all the encryption keys and go sell them to the Russian black market or something like that. Um, so with, with these kind of systems, you kind of get beyond the Amazon, hey, I have a key, I can do a thing. And you say, we, have, we not only have a key to do a thing, but it takes multiple of us to come together to do a thing. And, and then because it, you know, we can set it at any ratio we want, we can say we need three of five or you know, four of seven or whatever it is we want, and to solve the, oh my God, Marie got hit by a bus problem. So um, if, I, you know, if I get hit by a bus or you know, something like that, or you know, just have too much fun at DEF CON and never go home, um, there are people that um, can, can, can carry on. So this, this is kind of cool. Um, having having um, more than one having more than one uh, user required to do critical encryption operations of you know such as transfer of keys and stuff, backing up of keys. Because you know, remember, you know, that this whole confidential confidentiality, availability, integrity. <clears throat> if if we lose keys, um, that data is like gone. So you know, we've seen that in a few be, being weaponized as a service now, but um, causing encrypting data and hiding your keys for ransom. <clears throat> but um, when, we're, when we're hosting stuff in the cloud, we really have to think about that. It's like, we want to make sure that we can get this back, assuming an asteroid hits a data center or something like that. Uh, we we want to be able to get the data back. So having, having a way of, of replicating keys across geographies in a secure way on a very controlled environment uh, between like Free trusted people or something on our team is, is a good way to do it. This, this concept of crypto officers versus crypto users. And, you know, just this is a total eye chart, but I, there, there's actually some, some kind of cool things I'll talk about that, you know, as we get into some of these third party solutions that I, I think are neat. And, and actually, one you can do is you can actually say, you know, maybe, maybe the keys, and this, you got to use this, you got to threat model your application, you got to understand. What is your data? What is you're trying to protect? What is the blast radius if this is a breach? You may actually want to keep your keys on ground. You may not want them in the cloud. And so you can do things like say, you know, we, we want to have a, a, a Jamalto or, you know, for that matter, you know, the other with uh, Azure, a Talos, HSM on ground. And, and we want to do our key management on ground. We want to have our cloud apps call for those keys. That gives us a little bit more control. We act we can see what's happening, we rack a little quicker, we know there's, you know, we know we own the keys and they were never up there, so, you know, push comes to shove, we can cut off access to it, and that stuff's encrypted, nobody can get at it. But um, there are some kind of cool things, you know, if I've got my, my key management on ground, I can go into the data center and I can love it and touch it and watch its blinking lights, it's just neat, it's, it's cool, um, and know that all is right in the universe, that my key is protected in a very safe environment. Um, so, um, you know, that, that gives us, also gives us a, a fallback, you know, when the cloud turns stormy and black and parts of it evaporate because of whatever, uh, we actually have our, our critical encryption keys, we maintain control of them. Now, there's some kind of cool things we, we can do this as we start applying these third party solutions uh, to encryption problems. So um, let's take a database. Now everybody's, you know, God, how do we encrypt a database? And, uh, you know, running through a couple examples, like, you know, if you use SQL Server Enterprise, uh, last version, you'd use transparent data encryption. Sounds super easy. It is. It's really easy. It's turn, you turn it on and just use it. It just works. And your, your data is encrypted at rest, which, which, is, which is pretty cool. 
Now, there, if you think about that threat model earlier and say, you know, well, what are the implications of this? And start to analyze it. Well, one thing now that that's given me is by using the prior version of SQL Server uh, data encryption, data encryption, uh, transparent data encryption. And so I make a copy, or if I make a backup of that database and throw it somewhere and leave it and don't set access permissions to it, that's actually encrypted. So it keeps a person from getting at a database backup, which is awesome. Now, cloud introduces an interesting problem because, you know, on the prior version, you know, the, with transparent data encryption, is they may get the whole VM, you know, the, the whole running instance in the cloud. If they do that, you're kind of screwed because they got the encrypted data, which is in the database, and they got the key, which is in the registry. So if they got a copy, snap the VM, they got everything they need to reconstruct that, which is sucks. Sucks for you. And so you don't want to suck. You want to suck less. So one of the things you can do with the new SQL Server Enterprise, you can do key offloading. So you can say, I don't want to store the key in the registry. I want to store it in this strong key management system. Now, this can be actually in the cloud or actually on ground. And then with, with solutions like, um, with the Jamalto solution, they take it a step further and they can say, they can apply an encryption, for instance. So you can say these sort of stored procedures get privileged access to be able to utilize this key for decryption. So maybe I got a customer by lookup name or something, and it has access to be able to get to this decryption key to uh, this, this key to actually perform this customer lookup. And so I've got these store procedures that are defined in this application that can actually utilize this trusted connection to a strong key management and, and use these keys to perform operations. Now, when, um, when somebody when somebody does, uh, somebody pops your app and they're doing a SQL injection, so like star and users were one equals one, hopefully you didn't define that as a valid stored procedure, just saying. Um, <clears throat> if you didn't, that won't be one of the stored procedures that can be used. And in, instead of vomiting up the unencrypted user table, it will vomit up the encrypted data and the attacker's got this. There's some other things too, like with, with protect file, I can do things like apply some extraordinarily fine grain permissions on the files. So I can say, I've got these files that have this really important data in them and I don't want to be able to get at them. And I can say, this service account ID running this binary from this IP, this machine, can transparently read and write these files into that application, it looks like they're decrypted. But if I pop a root on the box and I've, <clears throat> my, my shell is bash or whatever, um, I've, I've got nothing. I just get, I get that data back in an encrypted form. So I mean, those are some of the extended, more deeper layers of encryption we can apply to stuff. So why would, why should I manage my own keys? I mean, Amazon, Amazon's got a thing, they manage keys. There are some standards bodies and some frameworks that say, you know, maybe we should be kind of hanging on to our encryption keys. You know, this, this is a good one, high trust, you know, it has some verbiage in it. Uh, well, you need to use validated cryptographic modules. That's a kind of a no-brainer. Um, you need to store keys separate from the data. And uh, key management and key usage need to be separation of duties. Uh, and keys shall not be stored in the cloud. There's also the new, the new NIST that's uh, the 853-5, which is in draft. And I love the line, maintain exclusive control of cryptographic keys. And remember, when you're in the cloud, you're running on someone else's computer, and if your keys are up there, um, and I, I kind of parse this, because there's ways of keeping Amazon from getting at it, but there's, you're, you're, you're putting the keys someplace else where people that have access to that application potentially have access to it. So it's kind of a complicated question about, you know, it's not like Amazon gives away your keys, but by provisioning an application to use those keys, you can allow an attacker to utilize them as well in a way different than you intended that application to work. So you intended the application to do a certain thing for a people, and he's using that same application to suck out all your data and sell it. So um, again, uh, maintain exclusive control of cryptographic keys, I, I love that line. And um, <clears throat> so if an application makes sense to use Amazon KMS, again, you've got to look at your Threat modeling, your application, what is the risk of the data you're storing up there? There's, there's, there's a lot of cases where it's, hey, it makes sense to use KMS. This extra stuff I'm talking about just, <clears throat> it doesn't fly, it's not worth the expense, the time, the configuration. Um, there's, uh, you know, there, there is this whole continuum of data risks. You know, some data is low risk, some's high. Uh, but you should use, if you're using KMS, you should only use the FIPS 140-2 certified endpoints. And they've got a table of them. Uh, that's, that's one of the things people screw up on is they don't realize that 
not all endpoints are FIPS 140-2 certified. You have to design your system and architect it so you've got a separation of duties and hopefully some using split keys. K of N, uh, sharing secret is really cool to split up a key into eight parts so any four people can come together and rebuild that key. Uh, so, so no one person has all the data, all the information needed to own own the thing, and and you have the Marie got hit bus by a bus problem, and uh, then employ key usage monitoring, alerting, and responses. So, right in AWS's best practices uh, for using KMS, they actually say to do some things, but nowhere does it actually say how to do it. And this is this is really kind of this is the hard part. Um, you should be monitoring for data plane operations and control plane operations, but like data plane operations quantitatively saying, you know, this application normally calls this decryption key 200 times an hour. It just called it 2,000 times in five minutes. Something very different is happening. So if I'm using those grants, for instance, I can actually detect that and say, I don't know what's happening, but I think a lot of data is leaving the building. And you can actually um, flip that and revoke access to that key until you can investigate, do an incident response, figure out, hey, did, was somebody just breaching me? And at least stop the bleeding. There's also control plane op operations. So somebody, somebody, say an attacker gets in and they want to start deleting some of your CMKs. Um, I would argue you, you sh should definitely know if something's happening to your CMKs. You know, the, you know, delete key, schedule key deletion. It's kind of a big deal. You know, you do want to do that as part of normal key lifecycle maintenance, but that, that is a big deal. Um, also, you know, building systems to do, to do this alerting. It, it's really hard work. Um, you know, I've, it, it's frustrating because, you know, people say, well, just use Splunk and shit, you know, which is like, it's, that's not really an answer. You know, this is, this is kind of a, this is a really kind of a complex um, problem. Um, I, I guess, you know, my, my approach, I have, a, I have a girlfriend who has a PhD in statistics and she's really awesome at figuring out this kind of stuff, but I can tell her, these are the things I'm kind of looking for that I think represent a problem and she can help me build stuff, uh, you know, this is the math, this is how we'd apply a statistics solution to look for that. And so I would advise all of you, you're doing this stuff, get a girlfriend with a PhD in statistics. I don't know, just saying. <laughs> um, that's, uh, you know, I, I want to produce some, some additional stuff and, you know, this would be like a full day workshop instead of a one hour talk. But um, there's, there's kind of some principles on there. But anyway, encryption and key access controls, you, you really need to design your plan. I'm amazed at the number of devs that, or, you know, when I analyze applications that are made by third parties, it's like, you know, where, do you have the documentation of how you assign, you know, grants and, and IAM policy and KMS policy? You know, you can obfuscate all the stuff, please do, but do you have any documentation? He said, well, no, I guess the dev just did it until it worked. And it's like, that's, I guarantee you, that's gonna be a problem. I've seen that in third-party apps, which is uh, suboptimal, to say the least. Uh, so you really need to build out that, you know, plan this, build out those IAM policies, encryption usages, and the context. And, and, if, and, and this really needs to happen in the application design phase. This, this is not something that I can just swoop in and fix some stuff later on. So in conclusion, uh, encrypting data in the cloud, uh, there's, it's very complex. And I just, I just led you through just something really simple. I want to put a thing in an S3 bucket. You know, and there's all these different kinds of you know, choices you have to make. And uh, there's, there's no, it's complex, there's no magic answers. And, but encrypting data to actually protect it in the cloud is more than just a checkbox. And um, you know we tell devs to never write their own crypto. We taught them that, but now with the complexity of cloud and some of these encryption solutions, a large number of design choices, we need to embed with devs, and we need to help them implement cloud cryptography architecture. And that's that's going to be really critical. I think that this is we're not going to get ahead of this problem unless we sit down with the devs and say, let's let's talk through some of the aspects what we're trying to do, and. Um, multiple completely different ways of encrypting something, like a simple, simple S3 bucket, and a multiple ways of using KMS or external key management. So you need to think about the threat model. That is, that is so, so, so critical. So we, we want to make sure that attackers can't decrypt our data by virtue of standing in front of the door and turning the key. We want to add some additional controls, like that guard station. 
uh, authenticating, authorize, you know, understanding your authorization or monitoring. Um, we, we have to engineer these cloud cryptography solutions properly to protect the data. And, and just to recap, there is uh, no magic crypto fairy dust that I can parachute in with at, an ex at the end of a project and somehow sprinkle that stuff on there and secure an app. It can't be done. I wish I could. I, I'd be a millionaire. But, um, I, you know, I do have glitter, but that's, that's uh, I don't know. So anyway, I'm not sure where I'm at on time. It may be getting close. Is yeah, we have about 10 minutes left for questions. If you have a question, please come on up to the mic. And if you don't feel comfortable, you know, we're recording this, so if you'd rather not be recorded and on the mic, please approach Marie after the talk is over. So we have 10 minutes. Come on up. And first, let's give a big hand to Marie for an awesome talk. Yeah.